I want you to find Deuteronomy chapter 6 and also the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 2. We're going to spend most of our morning in Deuteronomy chapter 6. You'll see why as we get there. But let's read Deuteronomy 6. It'll be on the screen. Just follow along. We're going to read verses 4 through 8, though we will talk about some of the other verses in this chapter. But Moses is speaking to the people of Israel, and when we get to this, we'll explain all the reasonings behind it and what he's actually saying, why he's saying it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. It sounds very familiar, very New Testament also. Matthew 22, for example, Jesus used these words to describe what he calls the great commandment. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And then verse 7 says, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Verse 9 says, You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Let's pray again, shall we? Father, thank you for each one that is here. Pray that you would bless our time in your word. Thank you for each person that is here. And I just pray, God, that as we look into your word, though specifically we're talking about parenting, the principles we look at can apply across the board in so many ways. And uh, Lord, we want to make sure that we're honest in that as we look at the scriptures. But Father, I do pray you bless our time together and we'll give you praise. Amen. Next week we'll be in Mark chapter 10 for the week when we do our children's dedication. There's some great stuff in there about kids and all of that. But if I could say it this way, each one of us have people that have influenced our lives in positive ways. Now, not everybody in our church is married. Not everybody has kids. Not everybody, you know, fits that category per se of being a parent. But we can still learn principles of influence We've all had people in our lives that have influenced us and people that we influence. For example, even if you don't have kids, if you have nieces, nephews, friends, co-workers and all, you can be an influence on them. I was thinking about some of the people in my own life. Dean Grotsky was a pastor that when I was a teenager and began attending his church, he, he invested in me as I went off to Bible college and we come home for the summers Spent a lot of time just about ministry, helping me to learn about ministry. I have a lot of respect for Pastor Dean. I've actually known him for, since I was 18. I mean, just been in touch. Then I thought about my brother, who's passed on and gone to be with the Lord now. It's hard to believe it's been 17 years. But he was an encourager and a man who loved God. And it was obvious in his life, my father-in-law, Jerry Brown, not the former governor of California, um, but my father-in-law, Jerry Brown, was an, just a godly man. Uh, he just down, salt of the earth, hard worker, blue-collar guy that shared Christ with people and was a phenomenal man. And my dad taught me a very good work ethic, what that meant. Uh, Contrary to most people, I don't only work Sunday and golf six days a week. Anybody who's golfed with me will attest to that, uh, and so they know that. My mom was an example of unconditional love. Um, we had some family issues, even with some of my, one of my sisters through the years, and my mom's unconditional love was amazing to see. We all can name people like that in our lives. But I want to begin by just talking a couple of minutes to parents, all right, of all ages. So you have your finger in Deuteronomy 6. Would you jump back with me to Genesis chapter 2 for a minute? <clears throat> I was watching this movie one day and there was this guy, they, they called him the warlock. He was this <laughs> computer expert and he had to be like, 40 years old, and he was still living in the basement of his mom's home, and he just played, he was on the computer all day long. 
I guess he was some genius with the computer. But I started thinking about that, and then, of course, the way they depicted his mom in the movie was kind of funny, but the, the point of it is, is, and you know this, and I have to always remind myself of this, we ra- if you are a parent, we raise our kids to release them. And that is sometimes very difficult. You know, you've invested in them. They grow up, they move out, they get married, they get on with a different life. Doesn't mean we don't love them. It doesn't mean we're not part of their life. It doesn't mean we don't care. It doesn't mean that we don't interact with them, yada, yada. But the thing of it is, there are some parents, and I'm going to tell you this from a personal experience for having been a pastor for many years, and having sat across from my office and talking with couples that have been married for a number of years, with children that were teenagers and maybe some that were older, who even though they've got married, they've begun to raise their own family, they have parents that just simply feel like they have to still try to tell their kids, this is what you have to do, you need to do this. It's almost like they can't let their kids go. Now, we all struggle with that to a point, right? I mean, I have a daughter, and there ain't nobody good enough for my daughter. I remember one guy heard her, and I'll tell you what, I almost made some phone calls to Nebraska. I thought, oh, we'll take care of them. No, I'm just kidding. I know that's lie, but I'm only kidding. But I mean, you know, that's how we are. These are our kids. But as my two of my oldest now are married and have begun their own lives, we still love them, see them, talk to them, involved in their life. But they've now got a new what I like to call, if I can put it this way, they are a new allegiance, a different allegiance per se. I have, sat, as I said, I sat across the desk and, and have helped couples try to work through this and dealing with it. I don't run into this much. You don't really do. I don't. I mean, most parents understand this. We've raised our kids. We love them. If you've invested in them, it is hard. But in Genesis chapter 2, I had to go back to this myself as I was working on this series to remind myself of how things are now for my children. I have a senior. He's our youngest. He's the tallest. Um, The other day, it was I guess it was National Sons Day. I didn't know that until somebody posted that. And so... There was a picture posted by Brittany from our, the wedding, her and Josh's wedding, and I'm telling you, I'm the short guy. I mean, Isaac and Josh and Ben are kind of all quite taller than me, and a friend of mine in Texas took note of the old short guy in the picture. But, you know, I thought about that. My kids are growing up, and two are married. One's in college, one's a senior, and life changes, doesn't it? And I go back to Genesis 2 as a reminder to myself of where we're headed this morning in Deuteronomy 6. God is talking about the fact it's good for man not to be alone. Even if you're not married, we're all social beings, so we all need people in our life. He specifically is dealing with marriage in Genesis 2, but we're all, we're not, we're not geared as believers, as people even, to live, as, live alone, alone and estranged from people. We're not, it's not how God made us. You know, I've often wondered, what did God do, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do, till he made everything? I mean, I don't know what he did. He's timeless. But I, I wonder, what did he do? You know? But even within that, the perfect communication, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's a picture of each relationship. But look at Genesis 2. Let's read verse number 18. Lord God said, it's not good. The man should be alone. I'll make him a helper. That's what it says, a helper, not a doormat. The husband, the king of the castle thing, you know, Woman, give me my slippers. Give it a shot, guys. Let me know how that goes. You know, but the point of it is there's a difference between serving 
and demanding. A husband is to love his wife, protect her. She's not less than a husband regarding her personhood. We should never think that at all. She is the complement to us. That leads to his statement further down where he says in verse 23 about this is the bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Then verse 24 says, therefore, a man shall leave. The word actually can mean forsake. Doesn't mean he doesn't love his parents, doesn't mean he has no relationship with his parents or doesn't hang with them or spend time with them, but he's making a break and, and technically, if you want to get really technical, this is also for the wife, but it says a woman, it's, but it uses therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, shall hold fast, cling to, glue is another Hebrew way you can say the Hebrew word, glue to his wife and they become one flesh. There's what you could call the changing of the guard. So even as we watch our kids grow up, I have to remind myself that I will always love my kids, I'll always be my kids, but I raised them to release them, and like you have, and hopefully I've done the best that I can. I always say my kids have, were blessed with an amazing mom. They were. And uh, I can't say more than that. She's, yeah. So we just need to remember that for ourselves. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard, but they got to learn to, right? So with that all said, let's go to Deuteronomy 6, because we're talking somewhat of having kids and family, but we're talking about everybody we interact with. There's people you work with. There's people that are just family members. You have neighbors. You have people that are in the community that you do things with, activities and things. That we have an opportunity to influence, all right? And so if you look on your notes at the bottom, I want to just talk about a biblical approach to influencing. This is probably a well-known passage to many of you, but I love this text. So let's set the stage. In the first three verses, Moses has called, well, in the previous chapter, he's called all the people of Israel together. And he begins to share with them the commandments that God has given him. And so he starts walking them through some of those commandments. And when he comes to Deuteronomy in the sixth chapter, here's what he, how does he begin this? Well, let's take a look real quick. Verses 1 through 3, he says, this is the commandments. Okay, so he's gathered everybody. He says, guys, I want you to hear this. That the Lord God commanded me to teach you that you may, what? Do them in the land to which you're going over to possess it. Now, it's interesting, at the end of Deuteronomy, when Moses is near the end of his life, he goes back and again, he has this long speech that he gives to the children of Israel, reminding them that, okay, here's what God's told you. If you do this, you'll be blessed. If you don't do this, well, you won't be blessed. And he's doing this here as they're entering into the land and entering the land or entering the land that he says, so you need to do, I want you to hear what God says. You may do them that you may, in verse two, fear the Lord. The word fear means to reverence. It means to have the highest respect for God. And then he says in verse number three, he says, you may fear the Lord your God, keep his statutes. Verse three says, hear therefore Israel, be careful to do them. The word careful means to preserve or guard them. He says, I want you to understand that you need to take God's word, keep watch over his own children of Israel and do it because you are going to be influencing generations to come and other people. And if you're my people, which the children of Israel claim to be, he says you need to take everything that God has taught you, you need to cling to it, you need to attend to it, you need to cultivate knowing the word, you need to guard it so that others will see in you God living out 
who he is through us. So he's encouraging them to do that. So I thought as I broke down this text, as I studied it and read and trying to fully understand this, there were three things I thought, okay, let's, let's just focus on three things this morning. The first is this, the bottom of your notes, first side. You have kids, you have grandkids, you have the guy you work with, your neighbor, other family members, friends that you're influencing. To me, this is the foundation for it all. We've talked about this before, but let's do, one, do it again. We need a correct worldview to pass on. We said this before, every human being has a worldview. Doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be written down. A worldview is what you believe. It's the lens by which you make decisions. It's what guides your life. So if you ask somebody, well, what's your view on a particular issue? The answer they give you, whether they say it's a worldview or not, it is a worldview. It's the lens by which we decide things. And every person, as I said, whether they know it or not, written or unwritten, has a worldview. It's how they make decisions. It's how they see their world. It doesn't matter how old they are. And the worldview is often shaped by culture. It's shaped by upbringing, what we were taught. We mentioned Sir William Ramsey, the famous archaeologist of the 20th century. He grew up in a home where his father was a staunch atheist. His grandfather was a staunch atheist. And so what Ramsey did is he grew up seeing the world as an atheist, that God didn't exist. And, and through his archaeological digs and his attempts to prove Luke, the author of you know, the Gospel and the Book of Acts, to prove him wrong, Ramsey became a believer. He began to realize that his worldview needed to shift. Well, in verse number 4, God gives Israel and us through the words of Moses, the Jewish worldview, we could say, their doctrinal statement of what they believe. There's more to it than this, but in one simple statement, he says to Israel, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our, don't miss the word our, not the Lord the God, the Lord our God, the Lord is what? He is one. Christians base your worldview, I base my worldview on what Scripture says, what we believe, the objective truth of the Word of God. In the days here of Israel, this was called the Shema. It means to hear. That's why it says, hear, O Israel, Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You see the personalness of this? Our God. If I'm a Christian, my worldview, how I frame things around me, as even as I raise my kids or as I influence others, is shaped by my view of God and and what He says. The word one there, don't... The word God, by the way, is plural in the Hebrew here. And the word uh, one can mean... We think, okay, so there's just, we believe as Christians, let's just draw it out here the best we can. We believe there's one God, but there are three persons who make up the one God. And I remember as a young Christian, I used to get a headache trying to figure that out. Because really, there's no good illustration. Every illustration that tries to show the Trinity fails in some way. I have to go with what the Bible tells me. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. God the Holy Spirit is God. That's my biblical worldview of who God is. The word one in Deuteronomy 6.4 doesn't need to be taken to mean that there can't be a triune God. In fact, some Hebrew scholars believe the word one there is very similar to back in Genesis 2 where we read about the man and the woman shall become one. They're two people but coming one in, you know, you might say, in in what togetherness, companionship, whatever. You might say that uh, unity of the persons is how one scholar put it. So he's talking really about the uniqueness of God. 
What is yours and mine's biblical worldview? How do you make decisions? What guides you as you raise kids and release them? And as you work next to somebody, and you're at work and you're, you're, you know, and, and, and you're making decisions at work, you're interacting with people and questions come up, how do you answer those questions? We, there's so much tension, it seems, in our world today. A lot of people asking questions, right? Why do you believe that? Why do you think that? And so it all starts with the fact that families and other people need to see us led by the scriptures and not by culture. A biblical worldview helps us to answer important questions, whether it's about humanity, the visible world, people's physical, emotional, and mental makeup. If I want to teach my kids about God or influence anybody else about God, I have to know who God is. But that knowledge isn't just knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's knowledge that influences my life, changes me, as he goes on to talk about in the next several verses, as we'll see. And I thought about this in, in this way. My view of God, which, you know, is try to be biblically based, has helped me, maybe it's, as it's helped you, to deal with things in, in, from my past or in my life as it has many of you. Knowing my relationship with Christ is the anchor that I'm forgiven, I'm adopted into the family of God, that he has made me one of his own, that he loves me unconditionally. All of those things influence me, hopefully, to be a positive influence on others, which I think everybody wants to be for the most part, at least everybody probably listening to this. Everything. I think it's important to teach, teach our kids and others a biblical world view. And we're going to talk a little bit more how to do that. But it all begins with knowing who God is and knowing where I stand with him. Hopefully, my thoughts on life, culture, believe it or not, even political, economic, everything is shaped by this book. So it all begins with this. But there's a second thing that I love about Deuteronomy 6. So if you flip over your notes, you'll see this. And it seems so obvious, but often I wonder... Is it really coming across in my life? Look at verse 5. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. He says, With all your soul and with all your might. It's not enough to say to my kids or to others, You know what? You need to love God if I'm not doing that. Or, if I'm not showing them about what the love of God looks like. It's not enough just to say, oh, I love God. It has to be seen in how I live. It's interesting, then, we see this. This, as we said, this verse is repeated by Jesus. It's repeated by James. It's repeated by Paul. This passage from Deuteronomy. And it's found in Leviticus. About loving God with all your heart, your soul, your might, your strength, as we could say. And the thing that sticks out in verse 5 is you, are, you shall, it's a call to the Lordship of Christ, you shall love the Lord your God. He gets very personal about the need that I'm going to be all in in my relationship with Christ. To positively impact others, I need to be all in, not half-hearted, in other words, I can't play church on Sunday and then the rest of the week do stuff that doesn't honor Christ. One of the things that used to grieve my heart is I knew guys uh, over the years that they, they were Christians who owned businesses and they'd come to church on Sunday, but I knew that they were running their businesses unethically during the week. Now, I've only met a couple of people like that 
but it reminded me even of my own life. You know, I'm not running a business. How I am Monday through Saturday is just as important as how I am when I show up on Sunday morning. So he says, listen, guys, can't play church on Sunday and then treat people poorly. I can't teach my kids to be honest if I'm dishonest. I can't say, don't get angry if I get angry all the time. I'm talking about sinful anger. It's hypocrisy to tell our kids to watch their mouth when we do not. You know? How do you tell your kids, don't be rude or vulgar if we are? So this is more than just a statement of faith. This is a statement of commitment to God. Love the Lord our God. It needs to be seen in how we live. My kids need to see kindness and compassion, caring. Other people need to see that too, especially when I tell them I'm a Christian. He says, love God with all your heart, which is, describes in the Hebrew and the Greek, often it describes emotions. It describes kind of our entire being, emotions, intellect, conscience. So he talks about that. And then he talks about loving God with all your heart. And with, then he mentions the soul, which is your personality, our self-consciousness, if we could say that. Then he says, with all our strength. The point that he's do, giving to Israel is he's challenging them to be committed in every area of their life to loving God. I can't compartmentalize my faith. I have my, because I did this as a young Christian. I'd go to church on Sunday and you know, I'd do my thing and, you know, sing the songs. But then on Monday at work, I, you know, might not be very, very spiritual or Christian-like. This thing I discovered, I went to Bible college and I went to seminary. And I discovered that just because you go to Bible college doesn't mean everybody there has it all together. I knew they didn't because I was there and I didn't have it all together. And I thought to myself, well, these... I mean, obviously, they all love God. Well, that isn't always the case. It's a decision. It's a choice to go all in in my relationship with God. And so when Moses has gathered scores, countless people, to give them these, this message, he looks at them and he says, I want to challenge you and encourage you because of the influence you have on others to love God with all your heart, soul and might it's very important he says to the children of Israel now let me say this too and you know this there are two types of people who ask questions especially as they get older there are those who really want to know and those who just really want to argue but when your kids come to you with questions about God and I know that if you've raised them and now they're, they're out of the house, this doesn't always happen anymore, but it does happen on occasion. But even if somebody you work with or a friend of, of yours or whatever asks questions about the faith, and they are asking because they're really wanting to understand, you know what, answer them. I've had people tell me, you know what, I'm just not going to... The kids will ask them a question that might be a hard theological question. Kids can ask hard questions. Adults can ask hard questions. If I just blow off, if I'd have just blown my kids off and never answered their questions, then my thought was, what am I saying to them that their questions aren't important and I must not know the answers? How, you know, I'll find the answers. You will too. We have to be willing to do that. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And then Jesus even adds in one of the Gospels, our mind, you know. Then I need to be able and I need to be willing to answer the questions. If you remember your children, if you can remember back this far when they were little. Not every kid does this, I know. But everything you'd say, they go, why? Why? Gets point, you just say, because I told you so. <laughs> but that doesn't always, that answer doesn't always work, does it? The point of it is don't ignore questions. Kids need to see us praying, living out 
the scriptures. And we will make mistakes and we will fumble the ball. I did on countless occasions, still do. And we're never too big to tell our kids we're sorry. Will you forgive me? We never get to that. Any influence I want to have on anybody as a believer begins with my loving God. And then there's a final thing that he brings out, and I love this. Look at Deuteronomy 6, verse 7. You shall teach them, meaning the things that Moses has brought out about God's word, you'll teach them diligently to your children. In other words, you will make this almost into a habit. It's instilling an idea. He says, I want you to instill into your children and we could probably add anybody we influence. And you'll talk to, of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now just think about this, just for a minute. Think about over the years, even in a conversation you've had, not just with your kids, but with anybody else, and you're talking about a subject or a topic that leads into a biblical conversation about it. You're out and about looking up at the stars. You see the beautiful sky, you know, and you, you can bring up the creator. You know, there's opportunities abound to teach truth by what happens in life. Nothing wrong with teaching people your kids, how to handle their finances. There's nothing wrong with teaching the kids, you see something on TV that can lead to a conversation about some topic or, or whatever. What Moses is telling them is you take life opportunities to teach or to influence. And you can do that with people you work with, people you know, but here's the deal. It needs to be a regular, it just needs to be part of a conversation. And why I say that is over the years, I've encountered people that you could not have a regular, just a conversation about how you doing at work, how's life doing for you, because every statement that was mentioned, there was always, it always had to turn into a, a spiritual conversation. I'm not saying that, I'm not judging them, but you know what, sometimes, if I'm on the golf course, and I'll use Doug as an example, it's because Doug's a good golfer. When Doug gets a good shot, I don't quote a scripture to him, you know, to, to, to show how great of a shot it was. I just tell him, great shot. In other words, we have to be careful to make, you don't have to force a conversation about spiritual things. All Moses says is, as you're walking through life, opportunities arise to influence and to teach. He says, that's what I want you to do. That's what I want to remind you to do. And I have to always remember that, you know, it, it, opportunities are there. It's really important. You know, we live in a world of chaos and decay and people ask questions about it. Man, a lot of people of all ages are asking questions about what they see in the world. Can I say this? Don't forget to laugh. Have some fun. Man, I met Christians that look like the unhappiest people on the planet. Life is hard, but God is greater than anything I'm going through. I need to learn to enjoy life. Take opportunities to teach. Let me say this as a former youth pastor. I remember being a youth pastor, and I had a family in the church, a mom and a dad came up to me and said, it is your responsibility. My kids are messing up. It's your responsibility as a youth pastor to teach them the word of God. And I said, hold on there, junior. I didn't say that. I didn't want to get fired. Um, but I said, you know, I, no, it isn't my job to raise your kids. The church comes alongside the parents but parents never are to pass their responsibility to influence their kids and others and say, well, I don't need to really worry about doing it because the church will do it. That isn't what it's about. We're all in this together, right? 
right? It takes a village to raise a kid or whatever, but it takes church, but it takes mom and dad. That used to drive me, and I heard that more than once as a youth pastor. Well, you know, it's your job to teach my kids spiritual stuff. Then what are you teaching them? I wanted to, always wanted to say, because you know me, I'm sarcastic. I always wanted to say, so you're teaching them the unspiritual stuff, and I'm supposed to teach them the spiritual stuff? doesn't work that way. We're in this together. That's the point. It's interesting that when you look at the, this, let's, we're wrapping it up right now. Look at verse number 8. He takes what he says in verse 7, and then in verses 8 and 9, Moses kind of builds on what he says in verse 7. There were Jews who took verses 8 and 9 literal. Let's see what it says, verse 8. <coughs> you shall bind them, meaning the commandments of God, as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So here's what some of the Jews did, took this literal. They got this round leather cylinder, and they would write out Bible verses, Deuteronomy 6, for example, and they had several other passages. They'd have to write, and then they'd curl it up, you know, wrap it up, and they'd stick it in this round cylinder, or they'd put it in a little box, and then they'd attach it to the wrist. Or they would put it around their head so it was hanging down. It was a reminder, in their thinking was, By having God's word either where I look and it would remind me of God's word or if I had it hanging down and mostly if you had it, well, you wouldn't want to hang it here. But the point was they would do take this literal thinking, well, this this will remind me of the importance of following God's commands. It wasn't meant to be taken literal, but some of the Jews did. Verse 9 talks about their homes where he says, or verse, yeah, verse 9 you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So what the things were called in verse 8 were phylacteries. That was the name they gave it. That's the Greek name in, in the Gospels. In verse 9, this is called the mezuzah. You go to a Jewish home back in those days, the front door is a little box. And that box has passages from Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 11 and then a couple of statements about who God was. And they put this in the box, and when you entered into the home, took your hand and you touched the box. It was a reminder as you entered into the home that this was a home that's desire was to follow God. That was what their point was. Inside the home, where there was any door post going into a door frame, going into another room, same thing. There was a little box there. So you go into the room, you touch it with your hand, and so on, and so forth. So you went from room to room, and if there were these little boxes, you'd always touch it. It was a reminder to the people who owned the home and the people that were there visiting that this was a home that wanted people to know that they were going to follow the ways of God. And it was their visible reminder of what Moses is teaching here. Those things didn't, the phylacteries, the mezuzahs didn't happen until later. It wasn't something that immediately they did as Jewish people. But I just think it's very important. Life is a laboratory for spiritual development. You know that? I bet some of you this week maybe had something happen that just kind of threw a curveball into your day. And how did you respond? How did you handle it? I mean, we all handle things different. But life is a laboratory. And you have, we have opportunities, kids, even grandkids, great-grandkids, people we work with, sisters, brothers, cousins, whoever, friends, co-workers, that we can influence them positively. But really, the whole centerpiece is my biblical worldview is based on my relationship with God but allowing that to filter over into all areas of my life. I've often been concerned with the Christians who just want to turn their back on the world completely and have nothing to do with people who don't know Jesus. Over the years, I've met Christians that could not name one person in their life that they even talk with on a regular basis who wasn't a Christian. 
how are they, those people going to know about Christ? If you and I are the ones put in their life, you know, and yet we just don't want to take advantage of that. Maybe we're with them every day, but, you know, we never would think about, not that you spend, you're not paid to evangelize. I get that. But opportunities arise. And if you're a parent, just influence your kids. And you know this, even your grown kids, we still are a part of their life. But they're learning the same way we all did, right? Kind of fumble the ball on occasion and growing. Man. I loved my in-laws. And with this, we'll close and go into communion. I loved my in-laws. My father-in-law, as I mentioned, was great. My mother-in-law is a jewel. And, uh, but when Sherry and I, and this was just for us, and I was in the ministry, and, and uh, so their church was right across a two-lane highway from where my in-laws lived. And I love my in-laws. And I remember that their church's pastor had left. And they came to me and said, well, what do you think about pastoring? And I thought about it, and I said, well, number one, it's Wyoming. Now, Wyoming's beautiful. But I said, I'd need the biggest satellite dish on the planet just to survive out here in the middle of nowhere so I could watch stuff and <laughs> things. But, you know, I, uh, it was a decision that everybody has to make decisions, right? And we made a decision uh, that just, to me, that wasn't for us at that moment in our lives to do that. Everybody has to make decisions. Other couples would have jumped at that. And we were living in Arizona. My folks were in California. Sherry's were in Wyoming, whatever. But it wasn't a question of right or wrong. And I loved my in-laws. But I, had, I just, for myself, as I thought through it, what should we do? See, everyone would make a decision different in that. But once the decision was made, nobody from any of the families came back and said, well, that, you should have done that or you shouldn't have done that or whatever. I just, we prayed about it. We sought God. We sought counsel. We did what was at that time for us, right? It might be different now. But it's how it is. Life is a laboratory, right? And our kids, as they walk through life, their life is a laboratory as they're learning and and we can kind of help them as they navigate. And uh, I will be honest with you, when I even let my daughter go to college that first time dropping off at school, old crusty pastor just broke down and cried. I did. That was my daughter. You know? And, uh, but, we're going to raise her to release her, right? Still love her, still talk with her, you know, I do that with all my kids. We all do that. So my whole goal is in this series is to just encourage us to keep on keeping on and keep on influencing in a positive way. Just keep on in days and not just our families, but the people that God brings into our life. Well, let's pray and then we're going to have communion, all right? You can find more messages like this one at oakridgebc.org and like us on Facebook for encouragement and event updates right to your newsfeed. Thank you for listening to today's message from Oak Ridge Community Church.